He is an excellent orator and I'm told a very engaging crowd puller. May I request the AV to be played for C.A. Neeladri Roy. C.A. Neeladri Roy, a C-suite management consultant and visiting professor. He is the co-founder and managing partner of a boutique advisory firm which advises marquee Indian and global brands. He has led multiple complex change assignments across sectors in India, USA, Europe and Middle East. Prior to incubating his consulting practice, Niladri worked with Aditya Birla Group, Infosys Technologies and PricewaterhouseCoopers. He is currently a visiting professor in IIM Shillong and IIM Lucknow. I request Managing Committee member C.A. Manish to kindly escort C.A. Niladri Roy on stage and present him with a bouquet of flowers on behalf of the ICAI Musket Chapter. Thank you, C.A. Manish. So the stage is all yours. Good afternoon again. Am I audible at the back? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I realize that I am standing between you and the end of the conference uh, on a holiday, uh, which is a big ask for you to be here. So uh, before I start, I thought I would remind you of uh, King Edward, great British king, who had six wives. I, I come from the Edward School of Public Speaking, which basically says, and Edward, in his uh, moments of indiscretion would tell his wives that I will get it done fast, whatever it means. However, since I have an agenda to deliver and the Muscat chapter has flown me here, I am like his last wife who says, Catherine, who essentially said that I know what is expected of me, but I do not know how to do it any differently, which is I would try to accelerate this conversation over a 45 minute period and if you still can suffer me after that, we would have some discussions and question answers. Is, is that good? Okay. Now, I, I need a slide changer, if, if that's available. Okay, it's, it's there. Sorry. Great. Now, I grew up in communist Calcutta, uh, in the times where, you know, controversies was a part of a Bengali life. And therefore, I thought, to be able to engage you in a conversation, I would choose a topic which is of eminent controversy today in the corporate world. And today's discussion, therefore, I kind of have learned to be politically suave these days, and we call it the challenges of digital transformation, but it essentially means why would most companies fail getting digital, right? So how many of you, by the show of hands, can tell me that you have been inundated with literature on digital transformation in the 12 to 15 months that went by? Just a show of hands. Is that an alien subject for you? Okay, a few. So most of you are not corrupted by these words which are artificial intelligence, big data. You are corrupted by blockchain, which is also a digital technology, but that said. So most companies in India, where I practice my major part of my work, are going high on something called digital transformation. It's like everybody and his uncle wants to be in the corporate value chain and said, okay, I'm also digital. So whenever we go and talk to our clients, we find three classical responses. And I'll start the discussion with those responses. Oh, before that, as good consultants to confuse you, there's a concept of a digital enterprise, right? And a digital enterprise is basically different from an analog enterprise. Most enterprises from the industrial revolution were analog enterprises, where there was a flow of information and your transactional systems, which were the ERPs or whatever uh, systems that you had, would capture data, and vaingloriously we would call ourselves being real-time. But there's always an information lag. So digital enterprises basically ones that capture data, mostly at this point in time irrelevant, uh, from different devices, social media, which is the Facebooks and so on and so forth of the world, and then they capture data and not know much to do about it. The whole conversation here is, why organizations fail is not knowing, even after capturing data, how much to do and what not to do. And therefore, in my work, 
we we get called in by clients. I mean, uh, we've been doing this for the last five years. We get called in by clients say, hey, I want to go digital. And this is what are the three classical, what we call archetypes of digital. The first one, the first one we call the defensive adapter, no regret strategy. Let's say, okay, I am a manufacturer, a big manufacturer listed in wherever, Bombay Stock Exchange and, and doing well. So we kind of, kind of make a line digital, which is a manufacturing line digital, put a few sensors, and typically the IT manager has become a CDO, put a few sensors and we become digital, right? Never works that way. The next one is called the wannabe digital. And the wannabe digital is the tyranny of the POC, which is proof of concepts. Now what you do is, this is a very good game to play to kind of satisfy your promoters that you've actually gone digital and have actually adopted the ways of the new world. So what you essentially do is do few irrelevant proof of concepts. So you get one line or one machine digitally active and then create a app and then say we are digital. The third one is a bit sophisticated one which is called the eclectic pretender. We know what a pretender is. Eclectic is a sophisticated pretender. And the, and, and the eclectic pretender is one who has heard about the Silicon Valley and great innovation happening in Silicon Valley. So they create a setup in Silicon Valley with young kids and pay them awesome salaries to kind of create an organization which we change the business model. It's called the mothership and the speedboat. Now, if your mothership is big, you know, the cost of transformation is very high. You know, if you're running a good business, you have quarter on quarter results to report, you have profitability mid prices, all the good stuff that good accountants do. Uh, I also qualified as an accountant. For the first time, I was called CA Nilaji, so I was kind of finding my, my feet in bearings. I mean, that said, right, so, so these, these speedboats are supposed to take off, and when multiple speedboats take off, the theory is that the mothership will capsize. Now, it's, it's a very plausible theory, and there are organizations that have worked on it. Now, in India, when we create the motherboard and the speed, uh, the mothership and the speedboat, we have the accounting tyranny. And what is the accounting tyranny? Uh, and when I say tyranny, tyranny is not, it's a value neutral word, and that's how I'm posturing it. It basically says that if the new business doesn't meet whatever accounting metrics, which is return on investment, market share, and so on and so forth, I mean, it's not really worth it because the CFO pulls the purse strings. And the classical dilemma between a strategic choice of going digital is often killed by our colleagues in the boardroom. So, so this is a very interesting case. I was asked to consult with a financial services powerhouse in Mumbai, it's a very, very big organization. They wanted to invest. They are basically one of the biggest insurance players in the country. They wanted to basically create a digital real-time insurance selling process. Now, it was analog to say that the insurance business is an agency business. You have agents, be it life or card, they go to you, sell a product, you pay premiums and so on and so forth. They said, now you can do it real-time. Obviously, the product is different. The market size is different and the actuarial models are different, people who actually make the product. Now this young group had configured all of this, but the speedboat never took off because the financial system said that this is not going to be 1% of the revenues in the near future, and it is going to be against our morbidity and mortality tables, and therefore it's not a worthwhile business. The irony of this argument is, when digital businesses take over, there is a hockey stick. Initially, it is not more than one or two percent, but when it actually adapts, and you will see when we discuss it with examples, when the business models change, they actually go up. Now, the limited point that I'm trying to make, that digitization in today's world, while it's a buzzword, and to cut all the, all the jargon around it, unless you have a very good understanding of where you're going to change your business model, it's better not to be digital. And that is the thesis on which I do this presentation. Now, just to get this a bit lively, there are, these are the companies I admire. How many of them can you recognize? Obviously, the no-brainers are over Airbnb and Gap, maybe. Do you recognize the other companies? Sorry? Amazon, of course. Yeah. Uber, Airbnb are no-brainers. Hilti, you do. Hilti is an exceptional company. Asian Paints from our country. 
G, of course. Right? Sorry? Michelin. Michelin is also. Oh, okay. Do you recognize Codelco? No, it's, a, it's an amazing company. Uh, and there's another company out there. It's called the Bombay Shirt Company. Have you heard of it? Yeah? Yeah. Chennai, Adair. They have a showroom in Bandra now as well. So these are also exceptional companies. So the pattern in all of these companies are barring a GE, which is an incumbent company, all of them actually transform themselves on the pivot of the business model. So the basic narrative in all of them were that if I can remodel my business and create alternative revenue streams and then engage my customers and then make my operational processes perfect, that's where I'm going to create value for ourselves, our stakeholders going forward. Now I'd like to draw your attention to this company called Codelco. Codelco is a mining company. It's a Chilean mining company. It's not small, it's about $15.5 billion. Codelco is a rare mining company which said that before trying to engage customers on a commodity product, we look internally, and internally what we will do is we are going to transform and create autonomous driving and autonomous trucks to reduce accidents, spillage, and wastage. It is, in its sector, considered leading digital. And somebody said Hilti. Hilti is also exceptional, and Hilti was in the business of power tools. Now, what, the reason why Hilti is remarkable is it had an incumbent business, and it used to compete against Makitas and the Bosches of the world. It used to sell power tools as a product. Now Hilti sells, it doesn't sell a power tool, it sells the service of using power tools as a service. Coming back to our, a very important notion that we need to recognize in tomorrow's world, which even the World Economic Forum ascribes to, and it says, the world of tomorrow, and I repeat, the world of tomorrow, products will be sold as services, and services would be sold as experiences. And there are a few companies which sell products now as experiences. Now, if you want to kind of figure out, there's one company here which sells a product as an experience. Which one do you think is of this list? Sorry? Yeah, excellent. Now, I, I, though I'm bad at accounting and, and financial stuff. Nike created Nike Digital as an alternative narrative to create a community of users who would perpetuate running. And in 2012, Nike Digital was created. And if you look at stock prices, which I did recently, it actually, Nike stock prices increased from 2012 onwards after the advent of Nike Digital. And it has been a unique competitive position. The other one, and we will talk more about it, is a company called John Deere. Have you heard of John Deere? John Deere, sorry? Sorry? Tractors, farm equipment. What business do you think is John Deere in? Who is John Deere's competitors? It's a tractor company. Mahindra is a competitor in a classical sense. Sorry? Kobuta Fikusa, yes, those kinds. But John Deere has completely defined its space from being a farming equipment producer to a farm services full-time player. And it has disrupted agri-sciences like nobody else had. And that's again another discussion, which I will do in the course of this conversation. There's another interesting company called Tokyo Marine. Tokyo Marine is a classical insurance company from Japan. Now Tokyo Marine decided that I'm gonna transform the insurance industry and I will use digital as a tool. And what am I gonna transform it into? I'm gonna transform insurance into small event-based buying process. Typically insurance, is to hedge on a risk on a lifetime situation. So you have whatever, marriage insurance, no, you don't. Uh, it's a bad one. You have a kind of life insurance, you have asset insurance, but those are lifetime. But suppose you were to take somebody else's car and go to Sohar, you're not covered by third party insurance, right? You wouldn't be. Now if you, have, if you are in Japan, you just log into Tokyo Marine, it will give you a five real insurance to cover you perfectly. So what it did was, it opened up a completely new market on an event, and that event could be anything. You just need to log in the event, and it partnered with Docomo in Japan to completely radically transform the industry. The reason why I'm telling you all of this, these are classical products and services who have 
first reimagine the business that you are in and then have used digital as a tool to kind of take them through the process of transformation. And therefore, these are world-class companies. On the contrary, in many of our cases in India and some parts in Southeast Asia where we consult, companies actually want to put the cart before the horse, say, let's go digital and then think the business model. And that's essentially why it's going to fail. Because you have no vision of how to change the business model and then use digital as a tool. Bombay Shirt Company, a remarkable company. It might be a unicorn and a major disruptor in the apparel industry. It's fairly well known, but not so well known. Now, you know the shirts that gentlemen wear, and ladies also wear shirts, and not being sexist on the subject. You know how many operations go in making a shirt? It's about 36, the last being the pressing operation. It's a perfect line management process. So I was told that I was wearing pink, which is right, Kuchisa pink. Huh? And from the yarn to the collar, there are 37 processes. So you make to stock. Correct? So you make to stock, you have a supply chain, you have inventory, and all the good stuff. And you have factories to manage, which make lines. So this is a linen shirt, so you'll have a linen line, then you have a blend line, and so on and so forth. These are called dedicated lines. Now, if I tell you, in Bombay Shirt Company, you can just go to the web interface. You can just Google Bombay Shirt Company and build your own shirt. Now, how does it work? Now, what you need to do is, you need to first select the fabric, select the spinner, select the button, and select the collar type. Now, most men know that there are two or three collar types. There are actually about 50 to 20 collar types. And then they will simulate the shirt to you. And then you can check out a handcrafted shirt made to you and delivered in three days flat in Bombay. Right? So it completely changes the line manufacturing process of shirts. And how does it get to do it? So whenever you go inside the, so, so what, what business is Bombay Shirt Company in? Is it in the business of apparel? Or is it in the business of technology integration? Now all of these businesses, like the great Asian paints, whom I absolutely love, they were industry classified as specialty chemicals. Obviously, planes is a specialty chemical, but they call themselves an experiences company. And in the heart of, the f of organizations of the future, the companies that we see today are all going to be technology companies who will harness multiple technologies. When I mean technology, it's a broader definition and not information technology. They will harness technologies, reinvent the business model, and give customer choices, give customers personalization abilities, and therefore, what you bought to stock are going to be made to order across sectors. And we see this as a defining pattern. And therefore, the organizations that are going to live this paradigm are the ones who are going to approach this problem differently. Similarly, if you look at Gap, and we'll talk about Gap a bit. Gap, apparel manufacturer, very different business model than the Bombay, stock uh, than the Bombay Shirt Company. Gap used digital to ward off a risk from Zara. And it's an amazing story. And finally, on this slide, when I come back to General Electric, an absolute behemoth. General Electric is industrial appliances, industrial goods. Huge company, cooperated. GE has a $6 billion investment in what is called the industrial internet. Now, on this point, I'll just digress a bit and call out the differences between the consumer internet and the industrial internet. The consumer internet, are the Googles and Facebooks of the world, where you interact on the net. There is social and so on and so forth. But it does not include the factory data, the predictive maintenance data, the car turbine data, or anything. It actually is the industrial internet where GE is going to use all its machines through sensorization and software, through its platform called Predix, and become what Amazon has become to the consumer internet, a very big movement in the world. So the consumer internet, as the New York Times says, is divided into Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and the likes. The, cons the industrial internet is now broken up between GE on the Predix platform, Bosch on the IoT uh, as the biggest IoT company, and Siemens as the industrial automation joint. The world is therefore, from a business model perspective, collapsing and collapsing very fast. And therefore, all incumbent business models including the accounting profession, as we talked about very elegantly, are going to be crunched, and new skills and competencies are going to be required. So what I'll do is, as we progress, I'm going to explain, I mean, not explain in explained sense, but I'm going to give you a light of 
what a business model actually is in, in very simple terms because this is like you know this is like business model is like democracy everybody has a point of view about it and there is no absolute definition right now it means different things to different people so i use what is called the send gallons framework and the center of it is the who who is the customer the what which is the offer the how is how you deliver it and the resultant is finance which is the results now this the value is the resultant so you do not don't start with value backwards to it you start customer forward now let's just step back and i'll i'll talk to uh, I'll, i'll make this comment in the indian context you know india is a young nation there are very few people of my age group left right having said so all our kids grew up being what is called digitally native my kids have been using iphones and ipads ever since they were born types so their experience of an interface from a customer and the experience required is a very different kind so if the population which is digitally native demands a service and a touch point which is intuitive it doesn't want to interact with a complex organization on delivery cycles which are unpredictable and so fundamentally in this whole equation the who is changing rapidly as the who changes your offer to the customer essentially has to change otherwise you'll lose the customer and if you cannot deploy it through a technology intervention you are not going to make money it's as simple as that now as we grew up we had notebooks to study right we had notebooks correct the nature of notebooks has also changed in india have you heard of itc's brand called classmate it's an indian thing it's a classmate so all kids use classmate but that's not the story the classmate uh, a notebook printing process is a perfectly analog process you have to get paper you have to print it you have to bind it and deliver it to the customer now one day my younger son actually asked for my credit card which is quite shocking but i i indulged him so he goes to the classmate site and configures a notebook which has pictures of himself his elder brother his mother not his father of course uh, and creates a pack of six notebooks at 600 rupees which includes 90 rupees of delivery so the product cost is 510 bucks and a class two notebook if you go to the local kirana store in bombay is around 120 bucks what what is unique in amazon that makes it into what is called an unassailable position i'll give you an example for fitness i buy a himalaya product ayurvedic product called ashwagandha It's supposed to keep me healthy and fit i don't know if it works but i believe it does so now there are two choices i could go to the himalayan drug website and buy it because it's it's also a web interface right they're also in that case called digital they have a web interface i could go and buy it there or i could buy it in amazon i am an amazon prime customer and amazon prime for a piddly fee of whatever i don't even remember assures me an ashwagandha delivery in 5 hours time which the company takes 4 days to deliver in bombay at a price which has a 10% discount okay you might say it's a 150 product 150 buck product where you need a 10% discount but that's beside the point amazon is an unassailable organization because it sells what the manufacturer can't deliver in convenience and ease and one of my clients which is a specialty chemicals producer it's the top of the line now i can't take its name in the public forum but the point is they cannot sell through their channels which amazon can primarily because amazon has is 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 not a platform only or neither is it a marketplace it is the world's most powerful data science this company which can model your data and therefore induce a buy much better than the original manufacturer for a commission which varies between 15 to 25%. It works for everybody. Now that's a major disruptor. Like Amazon is going to happen and has taken over the consumer internet, G is going to transform the world. Similarly for manufacturing because G is going to sell its product as a service and you will not have capex and everything will be opex which manages cash flows tax and depreciation better maybe. moving on i thought i'll keep a slide on this so internet of things is an umbrella word okay 
it means many things and also doesn't mean many things. It is a composition of technologies. Now, to be industry 4.0, you do not have to embrace all technologies. And therefore, I just wanted to call your attention to people, these are world-class scale companies, global in nature, people who have picked their battles well, but these battles are picked on the basis of the business models and have transformed themselves. And these are some examples that I will talk about. And the first example is a remarkable one. Have you heard, if I told you that your tires could talk? Okay, before that, I'll ask you another question. What is a car? The question is fairly simple. What is a car? It's a mode of transport, okay? Similarly, a bullock cart also could be. What is a car? So, so how does automobile industry define a car? It defines it as a mechanical device which transports people from point A to point B. If you're sophisticated, you will talk it's a mobility device, whatever it may be. If I just turn it around and say a car is nothing other than a computer on wheels, does it change the landscape? Today, when we talk about autonomous driving and big data and Google's punt on mobility, it is on autonomous driving, active and passive safe, safety reimagine, and the car is no longer a car. It is lines of code. So if you go to the Bosch offices where they are doing auto components, and you take a cross section of the car, it is hardly recognizable. Typically, I don't know if this is correct, a normal car, a mechanical device car, has about 10,000 auto components of a different kind rotating around the engine. Tesla makes the same thing at 17 parts and completely a digital interface. So if automotive and auto components get disrupted, I will give you another story of tire, the classical tire on which your device runs, if the tires could talk. And you buy tires, how do you buy tires? You buy tires, it comes with the OEM, it's priced with the car. It's a cap, and when you change the tire, and suppose like in Punjab, we have huge fleet owners who change tires together. So you would buy a tire as a CapEx, right? 40,000, 50,000 for a truck tire, four tires, one step knee, two lakh, 50,000 CapEx, right? Do they get depreciation on truck tires? I wouldn't know, but maybe they do, if it's an asset. Michelin, the great company said, I will change my business model first. I will no longer sell tire as an asset. I will sell it as a service. And they came up with Michelin Fleet Solutions, which was a big failure in 2000. So what, is, what did they do? Michelin said that, you know, what I can do in the tire? I can put a sensor. And a sensor is basically a code to a device which makes the tire intelligent. And when I put the tire into the sensor, I will emit the driving data to the cloud, and I will program the data. So what are the factors that the tire goes through wear and tear? It is torque, distance, terrain. Three major factors. The other factor is temperature. If, you, if the tire gets warm because of the torque and the speed, it can retread the tire. It modeled the tire and said, they don't buy the tire from me, buy it as an EMI or a monthly service cost. And what I will do is, if you do not meet the driving standards, which is overloading, which happens in India a lot, which puts pressure on the tire, if you do not meet my standards, I penalize you. But if you have good behavior and you go through the terrain as expected, I will transform you into a, your cash flows will change and it will be a taxable operational expense. It's a radical innovation in an industry which people thought could not change. And in year 2000, you know, a lot of these experiments have been going around. So, so it's just like digitization, which has come up the surface today, has a history long, long ago. Even big data as a subject was in the 1960s. So these things are now gaining traction, and therefore it is common narrative in the world today. Right? But the next level of evolution is making this conversation into a deeper conversation and meaningful conversations by leaders like you to take it to the next level for value creation, which is the evolution that we are looking for. Okay. Now the point is, when Michelin created this, Bridgestone also I think did it, 
And in India, you would be surprised, a leading tire manufacturer is setting up India's first digital plant. The problem is, in an Indian situation, the power is held by the distributor. Now, if you have a distributor, now what is a distributor? Typically, a distributor doesn't add much value other than financing value to the manufacturer. So he holds it, there is a discount, he has working capital, and so on and so forth. Now, if I eliminate him, your sales process and challenges get disrupted, which is not a significant disruption. It's not an insignificant disruption to manage. Therefore, the incumbent Indian organization whom we talked to said you fix the problem before, before going into a 500, 600 crore capex on a digital plant. Because you will have a digital plant, create a digital tire, but you're always going to buy it. And that is essentially the problem. Any questions, clarifications at this point? No? We are good. Or bored, whichever is true. Now, I thought that everybody talks about Eastman Kodak and how why Kodak failed. It's a well often well known case. I thought I'll give you a completely random example. You know, and we start with John Deere. Farming globally, there are companies which are huge companies that make chemicals, specialty chemicals, which aid the process of farming. And around two pivots. One is crop protection, other is yield improvement. Crop protection is how do I protect our crop from different elements of weather for decay? And yield improvement is more crop for that tillable land. There are two things. And typically, the big companies that played this game are Bayer, Syngenta, and the likes, $20 billion kinds. And the entire competencies were based on chemistry and agri sciences. So that's how these business models were built. So they had patents, they said, my card or whatever. In India, you have Indogal fertilizers or, or many such product companies. And they said, my whatever card or fertilizer will give you this yield. The farmer is happy, you are happy, and so on and so forth. Now, John Deere has been making manufacturing tractors from time immemorial. Now, here in this discussion, we are going to see that typically in the Porterian world, there was something called competition between likes. So like in our days, when I did some flirtations with Audit, PwC would compete with Ernst & Young. You would never hear a Starbucks competing with PwC. I'm making an outrageous example out here. The point that I'm trying to make, you would never hear Bayer AgriSciences 15 years ago call John Deere its competitor. Now this is what John Deere did, and then we'll go to Bayer. Crop performance is based on four factors, weather, seed, Irrigation, farm equipment. Intuitive, weather, how the weather will pan out. Seed optimization, which is what kind of seeds and whatever stuff you got to put in. Irrigation and farm equipment. Now John Deere was playing in this part only, farm equipment. John Deere said, I'm going to open a new market. And how did they go about doing it? Well, OK, you have to see it there. So first level is the product, which is the tractor. They added a sensor to the tractor. It made a smart product, put it to cloud, smart and connected, then created a system of systems and played into the whole gamut where they give field sensors, irrigation, irrigation applications through a platform called My John Deere. So you have John Deere and My John Deere. So the organizations which are analog digitally have brilliant platform strategies. Now, 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 John Deere was not in the realm of Bayer AgriSciences, but Bayer had to respond. And great companies like Bayer responded. And this is how they responded. They said, but John Deere has a tractor to go in and capture the data. We are going to capture the data from sensors. And from the sensors, I'm going to do crop protection. And I'm going to do G GPS surveys, figure out the patent of the crops, go to the command center, and through these mobile apps, give the farmer a service that is auto. The point that I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, is the basis of competition or the business models in the digital world fundamentally change. Now, if you look at the response time of Bayer, that was not far behind what John Deere did. And therefore, they could protect the market because they were also thinking business model. Now, imagine if they didn't. You would have a tractor manufacturer who's Basic competency is mechanical devices. Take the best agro sciences companies dinner uh, for breakfast. Okay. How much time do we have? 
okay, I'll just brush this up. But not every company starts with a vision of digital, of a business model transformation. Now we talk about Gap, right? Gap Apparel. Now, Gap is not a single brand. It has from Banana Republic to Athena to the Gap. There's a host of brands, so Gap is not a brand. It's actually a sigma of many brands. So they face these business challenges, which was rise of e-commerce. You go to Mintra or Jabong or to Amazon, everything you'll get at a discount. Now, typically these are 25, 30% margins, but you get that much discount. So the industry was kind of squeezed, and this is how Gap was positioned in the industry. What happens in Uber fashion? right, which is the Pradas of the world or the high fashion, they are never price sensitive, so they are not going to be disrupted. The guy who's going to buy a Mercedes at the highest end of that car is not going to compete even if a Toyota goes digital, right? So that part is insulated. It in the middle of the layer is where Gap gets kind of crushed between Zara and what Zara did. You see, you have to understand fashion, fashion is birthed. Fashion in a classical sense is birthed, and the way it was birthed, in Milan, all those fancy places in the fashion world, there were some people called fashion directors who would just, gazing at a crystal ball, would one day wake up and say, the color of men in the fall of 2024 is going to be pink. Now don't ask me how they get there. Okay, they took a punt, and then there would be beautiful models who would actually, men also have models actually, uh, and, and who would actually perpetuate the whole narrative and pink would be the color of whatever, right? So fashion was birthed, the entire ecosystem would be playing to that game and you would play huge prices for that uh, Fuchuska pink shirt that I'm kind of wearing. That is birthing of fashion. Now what really happens is when Zara came to the market, Zara said that hey, your product life cycle is 24 months. I can give you the same Me Too at eight months time and completely took away bulk of customers with another wannabe brand called H&M. Classical people like me would never go near an H&M brand, but they give it for the same quality at half the price. So now here we have the high fashion, not in Gap, this kind of a crash. So, so what happened was in 2012, Gap created the precedent of digital as an initiative, digital and technology, uh, a Harvard 84 graduate who was tasked with the job to understand the problem. And in three years, the first time that a technologist was made CEO of Gap, Nick Peck, and the first thing that he did was he sacked the creative directors. He says, I do not need to birth the fashion. I need to understand in real time what customers want, and if, I don't li if they don't like it, I'm gonna kill the brand, the color, the line immediately which was a huge transformation in mindset of people. And so, so you know what, people would queue up for Banana Republic and women would queue up for Athena to say, okay, this is gonna come and the fashion magazines would wrap it up and say, it's like Ache Din, and you drum it up well, uh, everybody starts believing it and they start buying it. And that's where the value gets created, it's illusion. I'm not saying Ache Din is an illusion, it's a politically wrong statement to make. But I'm saying that illusion and mystery creates brand value. Now what they did is, forget all of that, I need to get into the sciences of data and analytics, and they said that while I'm getting crushed between commodity fashion and luxury high fashion, from price sensitive to fashionistas, which is Chanel Barbary new fashion, I play the game differently, and I actually partner not with the fashionista, but Google Analytics. Because Google Analytics has maximum consumer insights, so I remove them by the Google Analytics, and social media, social listening, design merchandising industry, the important thing is replenish, test in stores. If it is going, test it or immediately kill it. Otherwise what happened, you know, kind of these, uh, these uh, clothes, they would actually hold it in stock and then over a period of time move the way. So, so I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's like, on the other hand, if you look at Louis Vuitton bags, right, Louis Vuitton is uber fashion. A cost of a Louis Vuitton bag uh, would be like a Maruti car, right? Now the point is, Louis Vuitton says that if you don't afford Louis Vuitton, and if Louis Vuitton doesn't sell, you know what they do to the bags? They burn them, saying that Louis Vuitton should not be held by women who cannot afford Louis Vuitton. It's quite incredible, so they'll not sell it at a discount, right? But if you go to Tommy Hilfiger, if it is out of fashion, you get a 25% discount. So the games are very different. Now Gap was caught in the middle, and they completely reinvented the business model over a period of five years. Similar case study you will find in Burberry. Now before, so my storytelling is over. 
but I would like to talk about what essentially is the key takeaway. Now, all of us are leaders, or hold leadership positions, both might be different. Uh, in the center, so there are a host of technologies on top. You do not need to be an expert on the technology, but to understand the usage of the technology to create revenue models, sources of value, responsiveness to customer, and operate a model where you have people to deliver it. I'll give you an example. Social media, okay, beyond the fab, fad, has a very big impact on consumers. It has a very big impact on consumers, and therefore, I'll, I'll give you an example, which I was telling my ex-colleagues of PwC. So my, my, my wife books a lot from Make My Trip. It's, it's an Indian marketing aggregator, right? So she goes on a holiday. Uh, I mean, she took my mother and mother-in-law to a holiday to Europe, which is an incredible thing, an act of bravery more than anything else, uh, to Europe. And, and, and while they were flying back in London, uh, Make My Trip got their visa, whatever, A or B visa wrong in Europe. So British Airways refused to take them on board. Is it wrong visa? So I, I, I was teaching in, in a business school, and she gives me a call that I need immediately alternative tickets to be booked, which I did. So and these three ladies safely came back home, and Make My Trip refused to have any conversation. They said, your fault, but it was actually Make My Trip's fault. So my wife is very high on social media, I almost said hot on social media, means different things, but very high on social media, and she just started tweeting, okay, with Make My Trip, hashtag with a whole case thing got 20,000 retweets. And the foreign minister just retweeted back saying, make my tip, take note. They obviously refunded it in two days. That's not the point. The brand damage that make my trip had was not funny, which comes back to a very important competency in organizations as far as social media is concerned, because social listening and what people are talking on the net about your products and services, that opens up a very big product or a service risk. And in India, at least where I come from, there are not enough social listeners who can tap onto what is happening in the media, opening up a huge associated risk for brands. So while there's one good side of digitization, there is a huge risk associated to it. Okay, I think I have, like George the King said, I have done it on time, and therefore, uh, if we have time, we can have a few questions, clarifications. I don't know if I'm competent to answer the question, but I'll give it a fair try. Yeah. Thank you. Now, you could help. Uh, Mike would always help. So it's a totally new dimension in which we finance professional accountant should think. And I really like that relook or look at your business model and then go for digital trans transformation, which is it. Uh, my query on your one of the slides is sir, about the Hilti. Yeah. Now I work for an organization for, uh, of which Hilti is a direct competitor. Which so, one was that? Uh, Metabo. So okay. we are the one of the biggest distributor of Metabo. So could you please uh, give us, throw some insight into the Hilti uh, business model or how okay. do you think that Hilti should be in the slide? Okay. Thank uh, you. It's kind of, uh, it's difficult to do a 30 second one on that, but it's, it's a very good question. Now, uh, Hilti is in the business of power tools. Okay. Now power tools are basically used in construction, drilling and stuff like that. It's an incumbent player. The important value creation, there are two parts of a power tool. One is a handle device, and then there's a tool head. Right. Now, you can sell a power tool as a power tool. So typically, construction companies buy power tools. Right. This is sold as an asset. It's a long sales cycle. So it's sold as an asset and bad khatam. Construction companies have a problem because the maintenance of the tool is not easy. There is theft, and so on and so forth. The second important thing was, Hilti was technologically advanced power tool on the drill head bit. So the value is created by the drill head. They then therefore said that I'm going to be commoditized any which way, and there are other competitors which are going to come in, my margins are going to squeeze. Now I'm going to flip this whole argument from the part of the customer. And they said that what is my customer's pain point? 
capital lock in cost it is not insignificant theft and also what is called calibration problems now calibration is a difficult one depending upon the drill head and the site on which you are drilling drilling looks simple but it's not that simple you have to calibrate the tool or the tool goes bad hilti says forget it don't buy tools from me take it as a service and i will like michelin did talking tires hilti said i will give you i will meet all your drilling requirements i will do the calibration assets are mine you just lease it out to me i'll give you another important example so i was with indian oil and indian oil is a fairly big company right indian oil corporation everybody's heard about that indian oil right it's india's top company now indian oil i was doing a session with the leadership in indian oil so indian oil is in classical fossil fuels right now petroleum is going to be scarce and people are not going to use fuel now what does indian oil do it is very easy for a consultant to say that it is going to go away. everybody knows it but there is a action inertia for people to go away from their existing channels so that gain is of no use after a lot of discussions indian oil came up with something which is quite magnificent they said that we will not sell petrol in certain segments we will sell fuel as a service said what is our biggest competency is to manage fuel store fuel combustion and i we would be agnostic to anybody's fuel and manage it as a program and as a service and take a commission on it and they changed the first customer was go air okay where indian oil doesn't actually deal with aviation fuel but they're managing it for them so even for the big behemoths who find it extremely difficult to change government regulated huge capital expenditure they are also making these shifts sorry that was a long answer to a seemingly harmless question <laughs> if anybody else has uh, any other questions i'll be happy to take it yes sir as a customer experience on uh, digitalization of finance and banking services is not very good maybe it is uh, you know they are handling uh, volumes but the personal experience is lost okay. most of the time uh, the problems faced are addressed by fixed mod model and we don't get uh, answer to a particular problem so uh, you know something like hybrid system should work well in place of digital uh, okay so this was not a question it's a comment no no i i'm telling uh, is it possible to have a, a, a you know hybrid system where personal touch is also given no no hybrid systems are always possible so in human machine interface on artificial systems are all hybrid systems now i i'm sure you've had a bad a personal experience in therefore making the comment but the point is about individual experiences and those experiences will transform over a period of time so we are at a cusp where the experiences may be good or bad but the inevitability of the fact that digital will sweep away everything is a real threat now the point is you know in anything a lot of people want to procrastinate about the future to hold on to positions which is a very fair thing that is you know there is like driving a car with a rear view mirror on a terrain say in wadi al kabir okay so that like that's past information it's perfect right imagine you have no windscreen nothing to look into the future you have financial data which is an event in the past and you look at it perfectly and you think you're in a safe ride works for few people it may not work so i don't have a point of view on it all that i'm saying is the truth and the inevitability of the world and the economics of the world and technology trends are colliding today different organizations are the speed of adoption in different sectors are different then that's where i'd leave it and bfsi actually is the biggest adopter of digitization because we've just signed up an agreement with a big indian private bank where we're going to create what is called a digital bank where there'll be no customer service everything on the tap it's one of our bigger digital projects okay, and 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 also as a consultant we go by what the client says All right, thank you so with that. Thank you so much. Sorry we don't have time for any more no, questions. No. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I'd like to invite once again for the last time rather CA Bhavani Prasad and CA Shanavas Khan with the managing committee members to kindly come up on stage and felicitate our last speaker of this annual international conference 2019.
Ladies and gentlemen, one more huge round of applause. Thank you, CA Roy and managing committee members.